out. All right, we're getting it all set up. And we're seeing some attendees file in. So this is great. We are getting things kicked off. So everybody just bear with us as we allow some more of our attendees um, and another one of our presenters to uh, join the line nice and early this morning. Mm -hmm. And how's my favorite chief marketing officer today? Well, we're just doing fantastic right mm -hmm. over here. <laughs> right over there. <laughs> right over here. <laughs> okay. Hey, Anna. She's just getting connected. There we are. All right. Sorry about that. Oh, good. Uh, it's, it's great, Anna. We're actually just allowing so the participants to um, file in as well. And so we're just giving everybody a, another moment or two um, to get all set up and uh, getting everything be fully ready before we get officially kicked off. I'm seeing them coming in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Yep, we're seeing people filing in just now. And I know we have got a lot of good information to cover. Oh yeah. This is one of the most exciting topics I've ever in data and analytics. Right, Anna? <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> this is a good one. Okay. All right. Well, we're seeing people um, coming in. So I think we will just go right ahead and get everything kicked off. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us on this Monday morning. It's like first thing Monday morning. I don't know what we were thinking. Let's do 9 a.m. Mountain Time Monday. We just get it, get it kicked off. So we are all here drinking our coffee, uh, getting caffeinated for Stop the Madness. This session is about adopting modern governance for digital transformation. Thank you to everybody who's joined us today. Um, my name is Kalia Garrido. I am uh, heading up marketing and events here at Great Data Minds. Um, of course, we always give a little bit of introduction on who we are as a group. We are a collective of passionate data activists, and we're on a mission to modernize the world of data. And today we're going to do that by talking about um, modern governance. So uh, we offer a full range of services um, around strategic planning, education, and the deployment of critical data projects. And we also produce a whole bunch of great data-related content, and we hold events just like this one that we're doing today. So um, please check us out at greatdataminds.com if you'd like to see some of the stuff that we are up to next. So a little bit of housekeeping. This is a webinar. So today, all the participants, of which you see more and more people coming in, um, your cameras and microphones are off, of course, uh, but we still want to hear from you. So we're going to be manning the Q&A in the chat. And if you've got something to share um, as we go, we welcome you to uh, pop it right into the chat and share it with the group. Um, we'll also leave a little bit of time at the end for a more formal Q&A. Um, but like I said, just pop right in if you've got something in the meanwhile. Mm -hmm. So some introductions today about our esteemed presenters. We have our usual suspect, Mr. Mike Lampa. He Hello. is our very own <laughs> CAO and resident funny guy here at Great Data Minds. Um, Mike has built an amazing career around working with enterprises to transform their analytics programs, both modernizing antiquated programs and then building net new programs right from the ground up. And he's got just a whole bunch of experience as an executive analytics practitioner working with some of the biggest names in the business, some global 100 enterprises. Now, today's very special guest is Anna Navarat. Mm -hmm. And Anna is, she is our resident data governance expert. Um, she is our senior advisor, assisting clients in creating and growing their own governance practices. And she has built up an impressive career working with legacy database theories and designs and how to best incorporate that information into uh, data and analytic solutions. Um, she also has led global mergers and acquisitions and probably most notably uh, was her time at Janice Henderson where she actually moved abroad to help establish their international data governance uh, program. And so Anna is always very busy working behind the scenes here at Great Data Minds, and we are thrilled to have her on camera with us today as well. Thank you. Yay. So Anna Yay. and Mike, I will let you guys take it. Take it away, team. Uh, all right. Thank you, Kayla. Good morning, everyone. And Anna, how are you today? I'm doing well, Mike. Thanks. Good. Good. It's going to be a fun 60 minutes. So, OK. What we're going to cover today. Um, here's your agenda. I'm not going to read all the bullets here, but if you'd like to uh, follow along, maybe do a screenshot and um, um, 
track along as we, we talk through our, our content today. Um, and it, it, our goal here is really to change the dialogue around governance. Okay. So for clarification, we wanna talk about a modern view of data governance. And it kind of ties into our um, four pillars and our foundation, which is the humans down at the bottom there. Um, data governance really has touch points throughout all of our key pillars, um, but it has a primary focus uh, in the data management pillar. So as we, um, as we talk through our point of view today, um, you, you'll see that we make some alignment into the lean agile pillar, where we take a product management mindset uh, approach to things where we're building these assets, these data products, and then analytic products that sit down on top of those data products. And governance needs to be a, a fundamental component and a fundamental set of requirements that are embed, embedded into those data and analytic products. Yeah, yeah, overall, I think we'd like to just see governance just spread across the entire life cycle mm -hmm. of your data movement. And that's a great point there around the life cycle, because if, if we have a product, every product should have a life cycle. We need to treat our data products and our analytic products as such. Right? Mm -hmm. All right. So I'll let you cover this one, Anna. All right. So um, after a lot of discussion at Great Data Minds, we started to think about governance in a larger sense. Um, it wasn't just a single thing, but a combination of technologies, processes, and procedures. So what we did is we came up with our little triangle here. The bottom layer of the triangle is what we call the foundational component. Um, this is the place where you build your overall data program. It includes your strategy, information architecture design, um, understanding the compliance and legal ramifications and expectations of your data, how to best use it, where it is, all that kind of stuff. And then kind of the golden copy, you know, and quality of your data. So that's what we consider foundational. The next layer is what we say is kind of product enabling. And that's where you're starting to grow more of your data literacy, um, broader throughout your organization, starting to set targets, um, how to better communicate status of your data. Um, it's with the foundational components in place, this also allows you to start to mature your overall program by thinking about your information security, um, management asset, uh, man managing assets, assuring that the data is being used as expected and being shared as expected. And as we go through it, we'll kind of talk a little bit more about why that's so critical. Mm -hmm. But um, overall, it's working at being more proactive versus reactive in this layer. Mm -hmm. And then finally, we have what we're calling the value generating layer. And this is our analytic product delivery. Um, this is where we get to provide more insights, not just dashboards, but more predictive, quantitative simulation type work. That's where everybody wants to go. And a lot of times our executives go from data acquisition to analytics. And the reality is we've got to get that foundational and product enabling in place in order to be successful at the analytic piece. Yeah, and, and that's so key, especially the use of data. We'll talk a lot about that. Um, uh, governance has to be more encompassing than just the data elements themselves. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's become more of a, it's becoming more and more of an issue that uh, has to be considered as part of your program. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So let's look at governance of your. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, our current quote best practices, they're really broken in, in the governance world. Um, we, we spend millions and millions of dollars um, and we're not really demonstrating value out of our governance program. Um, I've seen a lot of governance programs um, build a lot of good shelfware. I'm, I'm, I don't know about you, Anna, what's your experience there? Well, I think, I think you know, it's been the traditional waterfall. I think that's one of it. I think the other thing is it's always been managers of projects. You have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're finding as the company changes, as you get more data, um, it's imperative that this is more of a living thing. And I think the old approach just hasn't proven to be able to support that. Right. And the stakes are high, right? Yeah. Very yeah, high. I think, <laughs> yeah, I think more so now than I think ever. I think mm -hmm. by your second bullet there, that's that says a lot. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. All right. 
So the government program of your, right? We, we start out, we define this executive council, right? Because everybody's all fired up. You know, it's like, yeah, we're going to get governance under control. And then we create this approval council because the executives aren't going to really um, be involved day to day. Um, but the approval council doesn't do really do the work. They just approve the work. So we have to create a working council, right? And mm -hmm. now, all right, so now we've got it all covered, right? We got our councils laid out. Now we got to bring people in and get them to accept and adopt their new role in addition to their existing job function, right? Mm -hmm. right? And then we try to get the people to start writing these documents and creating these policies and guidelines and start to identify governance processes and whatnot. Um, and then the last step is we try to get those stewards to start documenting all the rules and definitions around um, proper implementation of governance. And as you can see, people go from elation to dismay, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, how many times have you seen this, Anna? Yeah, I mean, I think we, I think everybody's worked at some type of oil the ocean exercise, right? Where you go in and you're going to conquer the world and you get these big teams together and mm -hmm. spend a lot of money and you walk out of the door and business partners aren't happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they, they've got some seriously well-defined policies. Well, what you got is you got a lot of tech debt, typically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So organizations are really over it. You know, they're done spending millions of dollars and waiting years and years for no results or maybe limited results, right? And as Anna, as you mentioned, there's this technical debt mounting behind these these lag laggard programs. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I think it's just causes so much frustration. And it's, um, you know, not to mention the budget and the amount of time and, and stuff that kind of, you know, it was like, let's get the requirements, let's deliver. And then you get the big bang delivery and people fall short. Mm -hmm. It just happened over and over again. <laughs> I got yep. to participate in many of those. And I mean, yeah, you know, please, as uh, Kaylee has said earlier, all the folks on, on the, uh, a webinar today please share your your experiences um and or challenges even you know uh, if, if you think we're talking heresy here right. so we're seeing some trends in the market right first of all um there's there is a, a definite uh, migration to leveraging the scalability and the flexibility uh and the uh uh, uh enemies of scale uh, by going to the cloud. Problem is, is we we took our uh, eye off the ball a little bit when it comes to governance. You know, to make sure we're properly um, um, managing the, those data products as assets, right? Um, so we got to be careful when we're migrating to cloud. Yes, it's easy, and we can scale, and we can bring all sorts of additional data sets in, but we have to have a, a good process around that ingestion and that utilization and creation of those data products whether they're on-prem or in the cloud. I love that little guy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, so I th yeah, I think, I think when we talk about it, it's like uh, you look at the different uh, uh, type of uh, uh, laws and acts that are going on right now. So such so GDPR, the uh, Consumer Protection Acts, um, right now we do more self-service, People need to understand their data. So I think literacy is becoming more and more of an issue. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at the, the ability to go to the cloud, you still have on-prem. There's so many different approaches. Your data and your domains become more and more complex. Um, you know, even when you look at how data comes into the company, just the churn of data, um, people like giving different answers for the same question. You know, mm -hmm. reputational risk is another big one that is coming mm -hmm. into place, and that's all due a lot to some of the regulations. And then when you don't have that strong foundation, you have more AI or ML type of work going on. There's more data that you're doing. Um, you got to have more awareness and focus on what we're doing with that data, because that is another area that is starting to get a regulation look at. Mm -hmm. And so it's something that as we're starting to build your AI and ML world, you've got to be very cognizant now of what it is that you're doing, what's the purpose that you're doing it for, because those regulations are not 
legal yet, but they're being mm-hmm. talked about a lot. So mm-hmm. I think yes, people just are. need to be very much aware. And the best way to start doing this is to start building out your foundation and understanding what's going on in your governance world. Yep. And of course, you know, I mean, to uh, your point earlier, and I mean, the, the explosion of access to additional uh, data elements and external data sets and mashing them up um, and the complexity and uh, um, uh, you know the variety of that data is continuing to um, um, become more and more um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for I'll just say complex how's that <laughs> well you know they keep saying everything you read they keep saying that the data is going to more than double every five years mm-hmm. and and we're seeing that happen right yeah, right? yeah. that's yeah. kind of frightening because yep. then you just have so much data. What do you even do with it if you don't know what's going on with it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you mentioned GDPR. What's going on with uh, California and so Colorado? It actually, yeah, Colorado is the latest one that actually passed um, what they're calling is the Consumer Protection Acts. And uh, we, we wanted to talk a little bit more about it. So I've got some stuff I want to read a little bit here. So um, so this is targeted to anyone who conducts business in Colorado or processes or delivers commercial products targeting Colorado and have um, clients or customers in excess of 100,000 mm-hmm. in a single calendar year. So, um, and, and or sales, not and, or sales $25,000 in the year. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that $25,000 is not a lot. Mm-hmm. So that, that's pretty, that encompasses quite a few people. Where this is the biggest difference in color in California versus Colorado is Colorado bases is on a percentage of revenue, where Colorado is very straightforward in what they're expecting. Mm-hmm. Um, the law starts in July of 2023, and it's going to be enforced by the Attorney General and the District Attorneys. Um, one of the first things that they're currently working on is what they're calling is um, universal opt out language that we're all going to have to put onto our websites. Um, or anything where we're using with our clients. Um, if there is a violation or a perceived violation, because perception is reality in many cases, there's mm-hmm. 60 days to cure that violation. And there's mm-hmm. a $20,000 per violation cost. Um, mm. It sounds small, but just think if a marketing campaign goes awry, how quickly that can add up. Um, right. The five key areas that they're focusing on is the protection of assets, um, target advising, um, sales of data, processing of personal data, and profiling. So the Mm -hmm. other thing you need to keep in mind if that specific is if somebody's helping you process data, they too are under this act. Mm -hmm. Um, So as you can see with the map, you can see the three reds saying that we've already got these laws here. The blue's pretty much saying everybody's getting it. At the end of the day, with the lack of a federal law that everybody can follow, every um, state is kind of trying to play through this and they're building it off of either the Virginia, California or Colorado laws. So the biggest challenge we have as data people is how do we implement this? Do we go for the least common denominator or do we look at the most stringent? And I was on a call with a group of lawyers and they didn't quite have the answer for that either. So I think this is where um, there's got to be some strong conversations in the companies to talk about what makes sense for your company to do this. Yeah, yeah and there's there's quite a bit of similarity across the laws, but there are differences. And if yeah, you're, just small if, nuances, um, mm-hmm. and you just have to be aware of you got to be aware of them. So I think you know having a your, your data protection officers are really going to get inundated with this work, I believe, especially mm-hmm. if you work across um, the U.S. Mm, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then, you know, if you are more of a uh, global player, um, it only just gets harder and harder. Um, yeah. You know, between your your protection acts and your GDPR, which is also a consumer protection. Um, mm-hmm. But this one is. You have the right to be forgotten and you have to prove that right. Um, mm-hmm. you know, you've got to um, show how you're going to manage those delete me requests. Um, I think, you know, we're still kind of the tip of the iceberg, I believe, on some of this. When I was in 
Europe, this was still being developed a bit, and I know it continues to be altered, but I think people really have to keep in mind what, um, what you have to do as an organization to support regulations. And I think your, your compliance people have now become the new best friend. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Trusted yeah. friend. Whether you want to or not. Right. Yeah. Um, and then I think the only other part is that you have to just keep in mind that when you are working on these compliance issues, if you get a non-compliance hit, um, it's huge, huge. It's not just a money thing. It's also business disruption because you are forced to implement compliance changes. So that puts a stop on a lot of the other work in your world. Um, business reputation and, you know, so it's market share, client doubt, shareholder doubt, um, potential investors. Um, it, it definitely does that domino effect. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, you have your legal actions and fees. And then just, you know, potential loss of license to to even do your work, do your business. Yeah, yeah I mean, you'd like to take property and casualty insurance, for example. Um, okay. If you're licensed in multiple states and you lose your license, I mean, you know, yeah. you just lost a hunk of your business, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's not just the data itself, it's the use of data. So there, there's... Um, Anna, you mentioned earlier, um, there's, there's a pretty um, uh, focused effort um, in, in several legislatures right now looking at the proper, proper use, proper ethic, and looking at whether our machine learning models, our algorithms, um, mm-hmm. have bias in there that, that can disenfranchise certain um, segments of society. Uh, the, these are bills that are not passed yet, but they are they are being um, proposed. And as we get into machine learning, which are it can be an incredibly valuable next wave for analytics to, to differentiate yourself, the stakes are high, right? Um, well, and, and when I just say bias, it's like that is such a gray area. How do you even really um, right. prove or disprove on that? So yep. it's, it's really a discussion that has to always be in the forefront. Absolutely. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in, in, in a few slides from now, but um, it's this is real. The, this whole you know, focus on ethics and focus on proving that you don't have um, uh, bias in your machine learning models that can disenfranchise somebody. And as I said earlier, that uh, the rewards are, are amazing. You know, according to uh, McKinsey, um, the, the use of artificial intelligence or machine learning techniques has the potential of, of creating up, up to an, an additional six trillion in value. Um, and this was based on a survey across nine, 19 industries um, and nine business functions. So that's huge. But what comes along with that increased value is, is the increased risk if you can't demonstrate um, a proper ethical use of your machine learning models. there's no no stereotype with that picture is there there's a there's a data scientist um so the point here is is machine learning has a mind behind it there's a there's a person building these machine learning algorithms and there's a natural bias in the mind of the data scientists when they're designing a model because we're trying to influence behavior, right? We're predicting an outcome to influence behavior. So right there, because I'm trying to influence something, that means I've got a, I have, a, I have this bias in, in my mind and it gets built into the machine learning model, right? So mm-hmm. very important that we recognize that and then we put together some processes and disciplines around making sure we're double checking. Um, so governance and ethics, right? And um, you know, it's all about, you know, when we get into designing our features that are going to feed our models and then designing those algorithms, um, there has to be fairness built in it by design. We have to be very deliberate about how we generate our features and triage um, training data sets and testing data sets, right? Um, we have to make sure that there's proper inclusion and diversity in the creating of creation of that training data, um, because that's what's going to teach the model to produce the kind of outcome that we're intending to, to 
to uh, uh, get to and and predict, right? And we have to balance that performance versus being careful that we undesirable bias doesn't get doesn't creep into the algorithm itself and or in the data that's being used to serve that algorithm. Again, intentional by design. Um, and then the last bullet I'll make here is, is McKinsey talks about the need to extend enterprise risk management to include model risk management, algorithm, you know, machine learning model risk, risk management. Build that, it, it has to be a very deliberate set of, of processes that checks the accuracy and the, the performance and the bias and the ethical use of these models uh, before we promote them to uh, production. Yeah, you know, one thing I think people can think about too is, you know, stop working in a vacuum, mm. you know, sit there and, and say, hey, this is what I'm doing. This is how I'm doing. Get people's feedback and that can hopefully help eliminate that unexpected bias that might be put into that model. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Take Just advantage of the it. shortcomings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Take, take advantage of that group thing. Right? Yeah, so, sure. yeah, I mentioned uh, McKinsey's uh, risk management. Uh, model risk management and what they laid out were three key stages uh, and also what we're seeing is in the industry is the uh, the banking industry is pretty much leading the charge on um, you know lashing out this more uh, rigorous approach to risk management for our machine learning models and it makes sense you know because I'm doing credit scoring you know I'm doing uh, um, I'm predicting whether someone's going to default I have to make sure that I don't have uh, unintentional the bias built into that. So there's three stages that they've laid out. We're seeing that the North American banks are um, primarily moving into stage two, whereas uh, your, the European peers are still in stage one, but there is a, a deliberate focus uh, around this um, needs and, and model risk management as a discipline. From an architecture standpoint too, as a, in addition to having some good um, checkpoints in our processes and, and when we're um, testing out and validating our, our models, the rise of a feature store is, is gaining traction as an architectural construct. Um, and, and what we're trying to do here is, um, first of all, help the data scientists because they, they spend so much time feature engineering um, because our data warehouses and our data lakes or data garages or you know, uh, data lake houses or whatever you want to call them, um, they were not designed to feed machine learning models. So a lot of additional work has to happen. Um, and by adopting this architectural construct, we start to be able to create repeatable, reusable features that can be used over and over again that have been curated, have been certified um, and validated. Yeah. What do you think about that, Anna? Well, I think it's that that almost falls in line with, uh, you know, when you have a, a part of a query or a report or something, instead of people writing the same thing over and over again, you're able to kind of share that component. So it's component development, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think this is a, an area when we talk about governance where I would say we're still building the staffing model. Mm -hmm. For this type of a thing, I think we could say we have a lot of people who really know how to do this. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. It's a um, it's going to be a good um, architectural component, and oh, and for, sure. for people for people that are starting to think about getting into machine learning, this is one. This is some of the awareness that you have to um, have um, when you're thinking about well, what does that mean? What does it take? Right. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, um, and that same architecture piece we were talking through, um, one thing that happens, and we've all seen this, is the data sprawl, right? Where you have data coming in through your traditional way. You go, you get process, it goes through a little data warehouse, a lake, whatever, right? And then you consume it with reports, whatever. Then you've got these creative people within the business who seem to have access to data. And they're able to bring it in. Sometimes they store it on their desktop. Sometimes they will share it with the IT organization, but they also create reports and such. And that's mm -hmm. when you start getting data is living everywhere and you don't know where it's at. And that's when you start getting changes or differences in common, what you think you're delivering to be the same, but they turn out to be different. So data sprawl is one of those things that I think governance 
can help kind of get that under control. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we talked a lot about was like the reporting or the dashboard sprawl. I mean, I just, we've all seen where, um, you know, you have like, for instance, we had one instance where we had maybe a hundred different salespeople who got the exact same report. So instead mm -hmm. of using the smarts of the tool, which was Tableau to go ahead and send one report to everybody that maybe has a little bit of difference because it's who it's going to, there was a hundred reports for which made no sense. So, you know, so you, you want to keep kind of control of those things. So when you're having to fix or you're having to say, oh, I know how we manage your data, you're not having to go to so many different things. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the day, we've got the consumer protection regulations that are coming out. And, you know, like we're saying, it's not just a big money cost, but it's also a huge reputational risk. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, you take all those away and, um, the day-to-day -day pro um, progress in your data, it's, it, how do I want to say this? Your governance is not just, it's got to be a, a whole data enterprise thing. It's not mm -hmm. just small groups that are doing it. Everybody has to own a part of this because if we get it wrong as an organization, everybody pays. Right, but we need a vehicle to inventory these products. We talked okay. about it data products as an asset, right? Um, also, all the, all the uses against that data, we need to inventory that and track it and make yeah. sure we put it under some kind of a governance purview. Agreed, agreed. More time, more now than ever. Mm -hmm. Oh, so, and so how are we going to do that, Mike? Oh, no. Let's put our lean agile hat on. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so everything we've talked about so far has been discussing the various things that you know have brought governance to the forefront again so what mm -hmm. we want to do now is kind of go through what is used what used to be and how changes with the more agile approach can kind of make mm -hmm. it better right and the key there is you know that bold word there value link okay. value yeah. to governance yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. um okay so um I think uh, th with the modern solutions and approaches, the whole thing is faster time to market, lower cost. That's mm -hmm. kind of what we're going for. So with agile approaches and a solid strategy, let's not forget that strategy. We've had mm -hmm. cases that we have shown where we can deliver sometimes up to 30% faster than we did in a waterfall approach. Um, so with smart data catalogs, master data management tools, stewardship gets a bit easier and, uh, you know, you have a helping hand, you have to get away from the custom or older technology that we used to do. Yeah. Um, so there we go. There's our cost. Traditional mm -hmm. one half million, 18 months. We've had a few examples with clients as of late where we're more in the modern age and it's not delivering everything. That's what we need to remember. It's delivering slices a bit at a time mm -hmm. and then course correcting as we're doing it to ensure that we really are going to give them the value that we need. That sounds like a couple of lean principles you just brought out there, Anna. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and these, these are numbers that we see when we're out working with our clients, you know, the, these kinds of quotes. And, and we, we just got to get away from that, that long monolithic, you know, I'm going to boil the ocean, perfection, right? Um, and get to, as you said earlier, uh, Anna, very incremental. Tie it back to the strategy, find the value where you can move the needle by um, putting better governance around your data. And, and governance really touches the entire life cycle. So, you know, when I, when I put on my lean and then agile hat, you know, lean is all about continuous everything, continuously innovate, I'm continuously integrating and deploying. And then a very key principle of lean is continuous improvement. To your point earlier, Anna, it's, it's like do a little bit, get that little bit of value, get that learning, feed that learning back into the next wave, right? Right, right. So here's our approach, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so, you know, the whole idea is um, 
use agile delivery with focus on value generation goals and measurement. Those mm -hmm. are important pieces to that. Um, ensuring that it's implemented across the data flow life cycle from acquisition to consumption. Um, implement nimble and flexible government governance oversight. So mm -hmm. I think the hammer and gavel, hopefully we're not using those as often as we used to in the past. Um, you know, implement with critical data element mindset, minimal viable product mindset, find a way to slice it so it's small enough so you can deliver something sooner. Um, drive with the guidelines and the policies that value the business. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and the agile part of it is, is have a governance um, representation in your agile teams, right? So oh, that, 100%. yeah, I mean, give the teams the autonomy to make these governance decisions. Remember those uh, councils? Right. I need, mm -hmm. certainly I need councils because I need to have, you know, kind of a corporate buy-in, um, but the work happens down um, in those agile teams. And that's yeah, where this, mm -hmm. yeah. I had a place, Mike, where we had so many councils, they decided they didn't want to use that word anymore. So what did they come I guess, up with? <laughs> um, I don't remember. They used teams. Under, yeah, they had criteria on when you used what. So um, it still made them what they were, right? So the mm -hmm. whole ideal is um, think product, not, or, you know, and let's get away from project when we talk about governance, because governance will is an ever-living, evolving thing. Yeah, it's ubiquitous, it's pervasive. Yeah, so in other words, you're really never dead. Never, never dead. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sure loves to hear that. Yeah, and we mentioned about the, the corporate reputation. Mm -hmm. um, for some companies, that's incredibly important. Um, you know, for example, AAA. Mm -hmm. AAA, their value prop is people trust that AAA is going to show up when they, they need help, right? Um, and if they have an erosion of that trust factor they're they're gone right we're losing their market share or wallet share right 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 yeah yeah there's a lot of companies that fall under that Tell me a little bit about this critical data element approach Anna. okay so um pretty much and this is a personal story um had a pretty big initiative where we we're trying to create a master for um, product and uh, everybody who was involved, we had 200 plus fields, everything everything needed to be in there as soon as possible. It was all custom, um, you know, nothing, every, everything was mandatory, you know, according to mm -hmm. folks at the time. So anyway, went through the exercise, went through the bill, did it. At the end of the day, people weren't happy. We missed things. Um, it didn't do what everybody wanted. There was tons and tons of code behind it. It's like we always felt like we were going to catch up with it. Um, so overall, we spent a lot of money. It just didn't quite hit the mark. Um, we did a second chance on it when we kind of was a bit of a reboot. Um, and we did it more iteratively. Um, we kind of worked with our business partners to help prioritize the iterations. Mm -hmm. We didn't always make people happy, but there was always something tangible to work with. At the end of the day, I think it turned out to be a bit more of um, something that was used as an enterprise tool and not just um, within certain business units. And um, like I said, it was noisy as we were doing it because everybody wanted their attributes sooner than later. Mm -hmm. But I think we didn't have to really go back and fix as much. Mm, yeah. And so it, it just, and when we did, we would put it in a, in one of the iterations to do so. There was always something happening. So, um, you know, I still learned a lot from that. And if yep. I had to do an approach number three, I probably would. But mm -hmm. from one to two, I think it was huge, huge, because we focused on things that were critical for the business at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And a reinforcing the example there, too, is uh, when I was working at Honeywell, uh, we, we brought in a, a woman to take over our governance area and our master data management area. And she walked in and the very first thing she said is, we're going to take this critical data element approach. And I said, what the heck is that? And she goes, well, first, I want to understand what's the biggest business strategy that we're trying to drive. And at the time, 
um, Darius, who is the CEO, he said, our number one focus is to improve our working capital. That's our key to, to success um, on you know, Wall Street as well as all of our stakeholders. Working capital is, is influenced and uh, impacted by accounts payable, accounts receivable, and inventory primarily. Those three components. You know, if you can optimize those three, you're going to get a better uh, working capital result. So they focused in on just the payment uh, pay code terms or the payment condition terms for mm -hmm. accounts receivable. Got those under control. We had we had hundreds and hundreds of unique payment terms that the sales guys were doing to win the deal, right? We rationalized those down to 20, improved accounts receivable. Then we turned our sights on accounts payable, did the same thing. Um, and then um, focused on inventory next. And there was only a couple of key data elements that we had to get nailed down to optimize our inventory levels, right? So link it to the business strategy, find the value prop that you're gonna move the needle on and then um, associate the governance rules to that value. Yeah, well, and, and I think when people talk about critical data elements, you, some folks consider the actual attribute or the data element within a table. So that is one way you can do it, you know, whatever the data, um, you could do it, the data sets that are tied to business objectives, um, you can tie it to data that has high value um, in reports and dashboards. Um, it could be the data that causes the most troubleshooting resources. You know, whatever it is, it's like you target it, you get the buy-in from the business, you show what the value is going to be to that business, you measure it, and you share it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be this huge, huge effort mm -hmm. to decide what critical data elements yeah, I agree. And and you mentioned something about the uh, the gavel before, um, because we do very much support and embrace the value of self service analytics. Um, we have to recognize that there's some rules of engagement and and some lighter levels of, of governance that we want to apply to the self service environment. But as we come out of hypothesis testing and you know trying new innovation things and we start to move into more of a controlled pilot and then promote the production, that's where we want to have the tighter governance laid down, right? So it varies. Um, it's not a one size fits all. Yet. Don't implement a governance program like that, right? All right. So let's see oh, how so let's talk. Let's so talk we talked about inventory, we talked about inventorying and all that kind of stuff. Let's talk about data catalog, Anna. Let's do it. All right. So data catalogs have um, grown up a lot um, since I first started trying to use them. Um, so they have this augmented data catalog and it's got some machine learning ability within the tool. Um, Alation has um, is one of those type of tools. Um, these tools, they can track the usage of queries that are run against the data that you're tracking. It can mm -hmm. show the most used data assets that are used for specific topics. It can insist with the common data nomenclature, data lineage. Um, there's, there's a lot that it can do, and it can also kind of help you with some of your data literacy challenges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so um, again, this is one of those things where it truly is a life cycle mm -hmm. tracking thing. Yeah. Yep. So yep. yeah. Yep. And some of the componentry around um, these these uh, augmented data catalogs is where there's machine learning algorithms being used under the covers. Um, right. Where, um, you know, boy, I wish I would have had these tools back when I was wearing my data architect hat. You know, because you know, <laughs> this auto discovery and profiling and mm -hmm. clustering and making recommendations around PII. Oh my gosh! You know? Yeah. Well, and, and even it even does some data lineage, which mm -hmm. you know that's huge when you're talking about upgrading, changing anything within a big data set or mm -hmm. data coming inside. The ever elusive data lineage. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, we went through tool selection process for our clients earlier this year and felt that Alation was um, one of the tools that definitely met. A lot of those needs is when we talked about the augmented client mm -hmm. uh, data yep. tool selection. Yeah, but there's yep. several in the market. There are several in the market, you know, and and you you touched on uh, um, things earlier. Data lineage, of course, ever ever elusive, right? Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I really really liked was 
the ability to flow a new data set through um, a, a data catalog tool like Alation and have it deliver up all sorts of recommendations and alerts and, and you know, did you knows, if you will, um, to help me register and determine whether I've got PII. Right. Yeah, it comes, and, and, and one of the things, like when we were talking about um, knowing your data earlier, we were talking about all the, all the different regulations on there, the ability to sit there and say, oh, I know what data is considered PII, and I can mark that data across the board in a more simple way. Mm -hmm. um, that was one thing that this tool did really nicely. Yeah. The other thing I like, too, is, is the integration to the documentation. It wasn't shelfware. Yes. I could go click on... Um, the policies and procedures that are supporting the, the, the governance around the data sets. Well, and what and, that can do is that can also, you know, I, I've been in places where you have a whole system that manages your policies and procedures to um, mm -hmm. them living on somebody, you know, some shared drive somewhere. This mm -hmm. can just bring all of that together. And when you have to make an update, it's one spot. And, mm -hmm. and that's kind of a nice thing too, because yeah. it'll update anything that is uh, tied to that policy. Yep. And yeah. being built being built for the business community is key, right? So that you create this collaborative fabric. Yeah. Right, right. Well, you know, because you can also build out your data, your built your business glossary within these things too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, cool tool. And a yep. Sorry? I said it's a cool tool. Cool tool. Yep. And and all the cloud providers are, are getting on board. Uh, they all have a um, a, a data catalog to offer. Azure's got the purview. Um, Google's um, got a real creative name for their uh, data catalog. It's called Data Catalog. <laughs> and then AWS is Glue, right? So some good stuff uh, that the cloud providers, they're getting on board with this and, and they're making it uh, a fundamental set of serverless kind of capabilities for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's a must have now. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you're thinking about um, putting in a data catalog, some of the things to think about is, you know, is it machine learning augmented? Um, you know, it, it, it is a great first step to manage your metadata and to simplify it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, analyze your use case or requirements to identify um, what you need from a tactical data catalog deployment versus the mm -hmm. ones that are more strategic. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, deploy data catalogs with the capability to scale, scale beyond narrow use case requirements. So try and um, you know, have the broader enterprise metadata management program in mind when you're thinking through that, not just the silos. Yeah, yeah and that last bullet there is, is critical too. You can really produce these executive readouts. You got to publish this stuff, you know, the value that we're getting out of these programs. Yeah. Right, right. And I think that's the hard part too, right? Is how do you, mm -hmm. how can you even say the value of it? Um, so, you know, I think anytime you can tie some of the stuff going on to the compliance and legal things that are happening in the world, that's always a big one. So better understanding where your data is at that's mm -hmm. one thing that these catalogs are going to allow you to do, knowing what data to use under what circumstances with a faster time to market. That's mm -hmm. another huge value. Um, you can build out smarter users of the data. Um, collaboration abilities. These tools have a great collaboration um, insight so that mm -hmm. you're able to talk about the data and capture it in one spot. Um, you know, it's how to best use it, how not to use it. Mm -hmm. um, and then it also drives ownership. I think data ownership is always another one of those challenges you have. Who wants mm -hmm. to own the data and make sure that it's correct? And I think mm -hmm. this can help do that. I agree. I agree. Yep. So getting into data literacy, um, uh, organizations need data literacy and people want to be more literate. Uh, um, they want to be able to have confidence in the, the data products that they're using for their analysis. Uh, and they want to be able to understand what other people are using, right? Um, right. So, and the whole goal there is to be able to start to have some good, healthy debate supported by objective um, measures and um, background information to support your debate. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Like you said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And oh, yeah, like so this. one of the things I guess that you can do is, is baseline your current 
state of literacy. You know, just take a self-assessment um, uh, across the four dimensions of literacy, um, data knowledge, skills, working with the data, my attitudes toward it, my behaviors on how I'm interacting, right? Baseline where you are, and then baseline where you want to be in the next six months, 12 months, right? Uh, that, that helps you understand where you want to move the needle. And then these baseline assessments can help guide your literacy transformation journey, um, which typically is going to start with education. Right? And we talked about um, in Lean Agile, uh, I, uh, I love this one phrase of amp your people up. And amping is give them autonomy, invest in their mastery of skills, right? And then give them a purpose that they can believe in. This is an example of mastery, right? Invest in the literacy of your organization. Then you've got the people side of governance, right? Um, <laughs> so, you know, I'm sure anytime, or if you haven't yet had the opportunity to go talk to folks about we're gonna bring governance into the organization, it can get a bit frustrating because you know, you either hit your head on the table or you get major eye rolls. Um, people really just don't want to talk about it because it's just not easy. Um, but I think the focus to, is to focus on the value that the governance will provide the company. Yeah. Um, you know, how you're going to measure, how you're going to get value out of it. Pretty much every executive wants to know what's in it for me. Mm -hmm. um, you yep. know, go ahead. I'm just wondering if this is the executive council or the approval council. It could be either, I would guess. Or both. <laughs> Maybe it's both. It might be yeah. both. <laughs> exactly. Um, so we want to make it fun, but there, there is some challenge, isn't there? Right? Mm, yeah. yeah. Governance, you know, there, there is some natural contention that will surface when you're trying to agree on the proper implementation of, of governance um, rule on your data product and your analytic product. Well, for sure, you know, you're running it, you're going to run it a little bit different. If you don't already have agile methodology within the company, you are mm -hmm. going to introduce something like that. If you mm -hmm. don't already run things more as a program versus a project, you're going to have issues with the finance organization because that's not how they budget. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of um, contention. Yeah, contention. there is. Yeah, and and it just and the whole goal is to get to concurrence, right? It's not a majority rules thing. So use good techniques, understand mm -hmm. people's needs, understand their pain using you know empathy interviews. If you're in a manufacturing uh, world, walk the plant, right? Um, which is the, the Gemba walk, right? And use design thinking. We're, we're trying to understand the need before we start implement rules. And then if we link it back to the strategy, we know we're moving the needle in the right direction for the right reason in the organization. And right. be iterative, be iterative, continuously learn after every iteration. Right? Yeah. So it doesn't have to be boring. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, hopefully none of you are doing this. Right, right, uh, 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 well, <laughs> at the bus ride. Like he, um, he really tries in the end, he really wakes it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so change the dialogue, right? We're, we're managing assets here and our meetings can be fun. Um, it, there's ways of, of getting the creative juices going. So find fun in governance is what our message yeah. is here. You know, and I think in the process too, don't forget about your people. You know, mm -hmm. go in and like thank them, write them little notes. I mean, mm -hmm. just pat them on the back on occasion, send them a thank you and include their direct managers. Do whatever you need to do to let your folks know you appreciate the, mm -hmm. the work that they're going through because in the beginning, more so in the beginning, this stuff just isn't always easy and it, it get pretty darn frustrating for those yeah. folks. And bring a cup of coffee for this poor guy. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, so we you can always provide, you could provide little hats if you want to. There you go. <laughs> <Woo -hoo! laughs> All right. So let's kind of wrap it up a little bit. First, of all, put your lean agile hat back on. You know, business agility is the key, right? We want to be able to link to our strategy. We want to prioritize the critical data elements that are linked to the strategy. And then we want to deliver incrementally and iteratively. And then we, you know, we have some hurdles and successes, yeah. right? And sometimes they're the same things. 
Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> you know, your executive sponsor could be a hurdle. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, but if you turn it around, I guess, you know, it, it could be a key to success as well, right? Well, you know, um, getting it, sometimes just even getting somebody to help you with the sponsorship can be a challenge. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and again, we're, we're in our product management mindset. Get away from projects with a budget and focus say, as a core uh, competency across the enterprise to, to deliver, deliver data products that have governance embedded into them. Right, and, you know, and, and the big thing too is just to remember that you want to find the value to the business behind this whole thing. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, always tie some kind of metric to this. Yeah, yeah. And, and one hurdle that could be, um, that you could be facing is in your technology stack or lack thereof. Uh, so if you want to um, prove out some of these uh, enabling capabilities like a, a augmented data catalog, you can leverage um, um, innovation labs like the Great Data Mines Innovation Lab where you can try out uh, Alation, for example, for, for a, a you know, free 30-day trial, right? That's worth your while to, to, to experiment. That was our selfish plug. Yeah, how did, how did I do? <laughs> Good job. Yeah. <laughs> Don't confuse sales with delivery. Um, so, Make sure your executives are, are committed, but at the end of the day, everyone should be committed to, to own governance. It's not limited to these councils. It's like, you know, and, and, and make sure everybody understands why governance produces value. Wait, 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 wait. No, don't we want these all happy, Anna? You're no, no, happy no. This, this okay. looks like a very, this no, looks like this a real happy group. Yeah, this is not real, I would say. I think it's BS. There you go. I just oh. think that there's, <laughs> there are parts within governance that are difficult. And the little, hmm, how difficult might it be could sit in any one of these, but it's not an easy thing, but it is so worthwhile at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yep. And if you use some of those techniques we talked about before, that collaboration fabric will, will produce a ton of fruit. But, yeah, but I think the thing is, we know, you don't want to underestimate the change to the human part, right? We are mm -hmm. asking for change, and that isn't always an easy thing to do. But yep. um, you get the right people, you get some data champions involved, and um, I think it could be a pretty successful thing. Yeah, I agree with you so much. So we got two minutes left. Kalia, did we get any questions or comments? Um, yeah, we do. We do have a comment here from Sam. Um, Sam is reaching out to say that governance ought to be almost a calling for helping others to recognize potential value. Mm -hmm. So definitely avoid folks who phone it in or know the answer already. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's worth there. Yeah, I love that. Thank you for that observation, Sam. Yeah. Well, great. All right. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions? This is a great time to go ahead and pop it into. Um, the chat and we can get it answered live uh, while we're waiting to see if anything comes in. Um, please, uh, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to us if you're working through your own um, governance uh, program project at your organization. If you have any questions or need any um, specific advice, we can always help with that and I don't see any other questions coming in. So as usual, um, we have recorded the session today and we'll be sending it out to everybody um, to make sure that you all have access to it ongoing. Um, thank you so much, Mike. And thank you, um, Anna, for dropping all this information on us on how to set up the right sort of governance program and why it's so important. Yes, um, you're very welcome. Thanks, thank everybody. you. everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Everyone thank have you. a great Monday. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay.